Hey folks, my name is Miles Davis. I'm here with David, our Chief Product Officer here at HBE Aruba Networking. I'm really excited to share with you today our 2025 predictions for networking. David, tell us a little bit about prediction one. Well, you know, everybody's talking about AI. So understandably, my first prediction is about AI. Um, you know, a lot of people think of, when I think of AI, they think of GPUs. And obviously GPUs have been a big enabler in enabling these um, LLMs to scale, to build big models and be able to process large amounts of data. Key there is that data, you know, yeah. and if you want to do good things with AI, it really depends on the quality and especially the amount of data. So finding ways um, to collect data that's relevant to an enterprise in order to feed those models is becoming increasingly important. And, you know, I think the prediction is that people will realize in 2025 that AI is not just about GPUs, it's about data and that data has to be collected and guess what collects it? The network. Yeah. And so when people talk about networks for AI, again, the jump is to the data center, thinking about GPUs and how do I interconnect them all? Mm -hmm. That's super important, but just then your broader network, how do you collect all that data from your locations, from yeah. your branches, from your retail stores, from your factories, bring that into, um, into centers of data where that can be processed and fed and learned from, that depends on networking and it depends on a network that scales to handle all that telemetry. Yeah, so like the edge both as a transit, you know, kind of of that data, but then the network is a like source of that data as well? Yes, that's a great point. Um, the, you know, broadly, it's about getting network from all kinds of senses, mm -hmm. um, from business processes, from point of sale, all of that kind of data. Um, but within that, there's a specific instance of telemetry from network devices for the IT admin to help the network itself run better. So that, that's another class of telemetry that's going to be important, another kind of data um, that uh, drives the demand for more bandwidth and uh, more network capacity. Yeah, and I, I think it's really interesting that, you know, as we think about the edge and the diversity at the edge, you know, AI seems to be a thing that feeds off of not only the amount, but the diversity of that data. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see how that prediction plays out in terms of all the things that we interconnect around here. So what is it for your second prediction then? Well, with the second prediction, we're going to security. And uh, in particular, you know, there's this ongoing um, co-evolution of networking and security. And the kind of overlap between them is getting bigger and bigger um, with every year. Um, the prediction is that um, the CISO and security organization are going to more and more see the network as a piece and a part um, of a secure, full security solution. So the network itself becomes an enforcement mechanism. When we think about the kind of evolution of networking over the last few decades, when the internet started, anyone could talk to anybody. A professor somewhere could reach a server in any university anywhere in the world. And then as the internet got picked up and brought into the business world, people realized that's not a good idea. The firewall was invented to keep the bad guys out, protect your data on the inside. Then people realized that there's sometimes bad guys on the inside, and often there's people on the outside that you want to better communicate with. And so the idea of being able to segment internally um, to divide up your internal network as well, um, you know, came along. And that internal segmentations meant a huge proliferation of firewalls in the last few years. And, you know, I think, um, you know, we're at peak firewall right now. Mm -hmm. People are looking at how do I simplify things. And yeah. zero trust networking is, a, you know, it's a big buzzword right now, but really it is an answer to this problem. If you change the network's goal and the definition of the network from something that connects anything to anything to a network that obeys policy, a global policy that says what users can connect to which apps, under what circumstances, what IoT devices are allowed to reach back out to which control systems and um, servers. If you can encode that policy, then the network can implement that. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're seeing in terms of our devices is that we're incorporating more and more security capabilities in our APs and our switches uh, in our gateways. And that's really now creating this tool for the security organization to implement policy with the network. Yeah. So 
it seems like bad guys are getting smarter with some of the same tools that we're kind of using to move forward. So how are some of these segmentation technologies going to be able to keep ahead of that kind of curve? Yeah, well, segmentation um, is really essential in terms of containing the spread of any kind of threat. Because I think in these days, most people realize the um, it's not when, if you get breached, it would be when. Yeah. Um, so what segmentation lets you do is really, really contain the scope of that threat. And so if you have a network where, you know, say remote VPN, a classic way, where you let anyone on the network um, yeah. after they've passed credentials, then that person's allowed to do anything. Yep. If that person's laptop's compromised, then the s threat spread is very wide. The damage radius is big. Yeah. So the um, idea of segmentation, like a, a ZTNA example, is you don't admit a user onto the network. You admit the user to use a particular application. Mm -hmm. And so if the user's endpoint's compromised, the scope is limited just to what's in that application. Um, and so this, this is really, really important to deal with escalating threats. It helps contain the effect, um, makes it difficult for people to move laterally. Yeah, yeah. And, and that when not if kind of variable, I think is so true, you know, with the modern, you know, landscape of, of cyber threat that, that it is important to make sure that we're dividing up our networks in such a way that you, mm -hmm. you damage control. So that talks a lot about, you know, when we're, when we're on prem or on our networks, what about, you know, the reality that you and me, you know, we came from another place, probably working at a coffee shop. We're going to fly to another place tomorrow. How do we deal with those type of threats? Yeah. So in the, um, you know, in the past, people have dealt with kind of remote users as a separate category yep. from users that are in the office or on the factory floor or whatever. I think what we are seeing, and my prediction is that, you know, these things are going to be unified. Um, our customers want a single policy that applies to say you, no matter where you are, whether you're at home or you're on the road or you're in the office, yeah. the same policy should apply. What's different though, is how it's enforced. So when you're on-prem, it can be enforced on-prem. When you're remote, it will generally be enforced in the cloud, in, in SSE pop. And so what we see happening is the policy controls for that cloud enforcement and the on-prem enforcement being united. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that there's also some considerations too around the resources that you can kind of use on-prem versus cloud as well in terms of that enforcement and, and organizations being able to strategize over what makes sense in different places as well. Is that true? Absolutely. You know, there's kind of an extreme view that you could do all the enforcement in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and that can kind of make sense when you're talking about people reaching out to apps. But when you look a bit more broadly and think about um, IoT devices, and um, interaction between devices on-prem, it's actually um, much more efficient and much more practical to implement that security policy on-prem. Yeah. Like why do you want to drag all that IoT traffic um, up to the cloud and then back again if you could just implement that on-prem? The other big challenge with IoT devices is that generally they don't accept agents. Mm -hmm. And the primary way that most CTNA solutions work is with an agent that you put on your laptop or your phone. Yep. Um, no such thing in the world of IoT. And so the easiest way to enforce and segment IoT traffic is using the network that mm -hmm. connects it and doing it right at the edge. Like I think most people can just inherently see that if you're going to block something, the earlier that you block it, the better. Why, why if you had a castle with you know, multiple concentric walls, mm -hmm. like that kind of classic castle, why would you let them get all the way through to the keep the very innermost part before blocking them? If you could block them at the outside. Yeah. So really that's the role that the network can play and uh, in a broader kind of zero trust architecture. Yeah. So that's a really good prediction about enforcement. What about anything on identity? What do you think is going to happen in the identity space? Yeah. So, so one of the, one of the key things with ZTNA is that it is identity based. So, the rules are not based on your IP address or where you are or the device that you're coming from. It's mm -hmm. based on um, you and uh, identifying what you're allowed and not allowed to do. Yeah. And so that is a uh, incredibly important part and a, and a base of what we're doing with ZTNA. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So moving along, what's the next prediction? Well, the next prediction is all about the life of the network admin and how's that going to change. You know, I think 
in the last few decades, um, being a network admin, a lot of it has been about knowing all of the details of Arcane CLI um, and getting like alphabet soup, um, CC, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. um, uh, qualifications and trying to stay on top of all of that. And oftentimes um, that treadmill means that people are just having to uh, learn all of this arcane stuff, spend less time on the problems that their business wants them to solve or the experiences that the users are wanting mm -hmm. to have. Um, when you think about what um, AI does with respect to, you know, generating text and being able to help people with um, responding to an email or whatever, there's an analogy in networking and we can use AI to make the IT admins job much easier to turn the IT admins into super admins. Yeah. Um, one of the things that AI does is essentially make it much easier to learn and adopt new technology. So often when a new technology came out in the past, you had to go learn a whole new set of CLI, learn a whole new um, vocabulary, mm -hmm. get a whole new certification. And you needed to maintain it. You needed to stay on top of it. If you didn't use these things for a year, you might forget. I think with AI, you can describe with an AI assistant in a high level terms what it is you're trying to do. You know, I want to implement um, sustainable control of power for mm -hmm. my APs. And you don't have to know anything about the CLI that's involved, anything about the features that are under there. The assistant can help you do that. And so this is going to really allow um, the admin to get more done, mm -hmm. but it's also going to let them move faster with new technologies and also with new vendors. A lot of um, IT admins feel kind of locked in to maybe the major vendor because they've made a big investment in understanding that technology and they're worried about the ramp when they shift to another vendor. But with AI, we um, can make that transition much easier for people, make it easy for them to adopt our technology and not just get up the learning curve, but go beyond that yeah. and uh, do a better job for their users and what they've been able to do traditionally. So with that speed up, what other kind of things do you foresee network administrators being able to do with that time that they save? Like obviously some of the use cases that you highlighted, but but do you have some some insight on where network admins are going to go with their with their path and their skills? Yeah, well, I think the uh, the real focus is on the outcome, on the user's experience, mm -hmm. and thinking about what they can do for the users to deliver a better experience. Um, there's kind of the experience of the employee or the guests in the hotel or the patient in the hospital. Um, there's also the um, you know, what it's doing for the business. How can they help that business be more efficient delivering those experiences? So sometimes when people think about efficiency, they think about cost savings. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. You can do things that deliver a better experience and deliver it more cost-effectively. So when you look at things like digitization of, um, of experiences to make it easier for, say, guests on a cruise ship to get things done, mm -hmm. um, all of those kind of things add real value to a business. Um, and uh, places where IT can play a really big role in creating value, creating great experience. Yeah. There seems to be uh, this kind of interesting thought out there that that when the word AI, you know, especially for these kind of things gets thrown around, um, that, you know, that means that you got to be in cloud and that type of thing. Give me some thoughts about whether you think that's true or whether you think there's an opportunity for, for on-prem operators to be able to to have some success in in using these tools and in, in more of an on-prem deployment yeah well i i think it really depends on what you're trying to do but it, for many customers data sovereignty is very important so mm -hmm. they want to better control their data and so the idea of um, feeding that to a third party and losing control of that data is something they're worried about yeah. so at hpe we are very focused on giving customers choice and being able to let them um, bring AI technology on-prem. Um, you know, there's different steps in kind of the AI value chain from tra training through the tuning through the inference. Yep. And um, depending on the enterprise or the organization and what they're trying to achieve, um, there's a lot that can be done on-prem. Yeah. So it seems like customers, you know, are, are in this world in which uh, ultimately there's a lot of variables that they've got to work through. Um, I'm, you know, kind of imagining as well 
there's a reality in which while uh, one vendor solutions could be, you know, there for some customers, it's probably not there for all. So do you have any predictions kind of down that lane? Yeah. So my last prediction is really around the um, around the rise of multi-vendor AI powered systems. So mm-hmm. if you look today, almost every vendor talks about how they're going to use AI in their management system. But what I hear from customers is, hey, you guys have got this, this competitor A and competitor B have got something similar. But what none of you have and what I need is a AI-based management system that can provide insights across different vendors' technology, not just for part of my network, but for all of my network. Mm-hmm. And what, um, what I see coming, and indeed what we previewed, is the ability to be able to use Aruba Central to manage not just Aruba equipment, but also equipment from most of our competitors. Yeah. And it's not just about um, collecting the telemetry. We're also taking that and normalizing it the same way we do our own data, feeding it into our data lakes that are used in our AI training models. And mm-hmm. so we're going to be able to provide AI insights, identifying problems or um, um, opportunities for optimization, not just within our own part of the network and our own equipment, but in the other parts of the network that um, the customer has. And so we'll really, really, again, be helping the admin become the super admin. Mm -hmm. We're going to be kind of pulling down the barriers that are inherent in in kind of the lock-in with the old CLI-based approaches. Um, And um, instead of having to think of a multi-vendor network in terms of a bunch of siloed systems, our AI will be able to look at it holistically. Yeah. Um, So I think it's going to really, really... Um, change things. A bit like what I was talking about before. I think it's going to make it easier for customers to adopt our technology um, and to be able to kind of move forwards without being locked in. Yeah. So sometimes I, I feel like this conversation around being able to manage multiple vendors just, you know, pigeonholes into or or be able to collect data from this variety, pigeonholes into uh, network management, but do you see anything happening around combining data across kind of multiple uh, network adjacent, you know, capabilities would be the best way? Yeah. So um, the underlying um, technology we've, we've been using is from a company HP acquired called OpsRamp. Mm-hmm. And um, that OpsRamp technology isn't just for networking equipment. It also collects telemetry for storage and servers, um, compute and so there's actually a, uh, an ability going forwards for us to correlate across all of that. So we've got customers asking, for instance, can you help me um, cross-correlate and identify multi-domain problems, mm-hmm. say, in my big box stores, looking across storage, compute, and networking? So yeah. the prediction here, I was narrowing it a little bit towards multi-vendor networking. Yep. But you know, ultimately the same approach applies to multi-vendor IT mm. and multi-domain IT. Yeah. And, you know, the the um, the power of AI to span all of that and to be able to provide insights across all of that is something that's yet to be unleashed, but really exciting. Yeah. Well, David, thank you. Any other final thoughts about exciting things happening in 2025? Well, we'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> okay. Thanks, David. <laughs>